So here we are, number 10, dude. You're number 10. Wow. Real Singers on really? Singers, number 10, with Tony Harnell from one of my favorite bands when I was in high school. That's right, TNT. And you're also with, uh, was it Westworld, right? Westworld, Starbreaker. Starbreaker. Um, and I had a couple projects, uh, Mercury Train and, Mercury and Train. the Wildflowers. Wildflowers. And there you go. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'll skip one of them. <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. See, I was there. I was in one band for nine months. No. There, all right. So here we go. And, and, and Skid Row as well. You sang with Skid Row. We're gonna. We're gonna That's what that I was out. gonna say. That's yeah. right. Oh, you skipped that one. I got you. Um, but anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is actually a podcast that's very special to me because not only is it, you're someone that I listen to, and me and Greg D'Onofrio. And Matt Franklin, formerly uh, or uh, otherwise known as Matt Starr, um, also uh, Greg Petrella, who is uh, missing in action, and Matt Corey. Every day on the way to school in high school, you were one of the uh, cassettes. Cassettes. Did you hear that? Yes. You were one of the cassettes, <laughs> dude. You were one of the yes. cassettes we put in. Like it, it's a rare. And also, it's very special because. You being Matt Corey's boyfriend, I mean lover. No, I mean no, no, no. I mean Matt Corey's <laughs> friend. Excuse me. And Matt Corey has been texting me all day with questions. Is he, is, <laughs> I told him to join in, and I think he's so freaked out he doesn't know what to oh, do. Oh please! He's so scared. So this is dedicated to Matt Corey. Matt Corey, right now, Matt, pull your pants up. Don't do that when we're doing this podcast. That's not nice. <laughs> you know, I, already I heard this was like a serious singer thing, but I can tell that's not that's not happening. It's serious sometimes, and sometimes it's just not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's start starting with high school and cassettes. You've already made me feel about eighty-five years old, well, so that's we're, good. We're all there, right? It's so so weird. <laughs> it's so weird. Remember the days of non-auto tune, which we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about. How yeah. we used to record as opposed to the way we all record now and the way we're supposed to record now and the way it has to be recorded now. It's very strange. It's very different, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a sure. strange place that we're at. <clears throat> Definitely. Yep. Yeah. So we're going to well, go back. Let, let's start at the beginning, man. You are a really you, – you are one of those singers that when I was in high school – and me and Greg and Matt and Greg and Greg were all in – were in – we took uh, – we had a small high school. There's only like six, 700 people in our high school. Little town, Rocky Hill, Connecticut. And, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, coast, super small. Cool. And, and, and we, we, you know, we wanted to – you know, we were the only – there was only a couple bands. There was a Van Halen tribute band with Joe Frascarelli and who was an amazing guitar player who could play all the Halen stuff. He had his thing and then we had our thing. And that was basically it in our high school except for Bill Merman and those guys. They were a little bit older. Uh, a couple years older, and they had bands that they were doing, their Judas Priest and that kind of stuff. But we were we were coming up, and so we didn't have a singer. We didn't have a bass player, and we didn't have a singer. So, <laughs> you know, we were like, well, at least let's all take the choir class together because at least it's all girls and us. So maybe we can get something out of this, and then, yeah. and then, <laughs> and then maybe we can learn about singing because Greg, our singer, like he wanted to sing all the stuff 
you know, that we were listening to, you know, when that was, that was Striper, that was TNT, that was Judas Priest, that was Iron Maiden, that was Led Zeppelin, that was Foreigner, that was Journey. And so when we would bring this to our choir teacher, Miss Benoit, and, and I, I'm not going <laughs> to... Miss who? Miss Benoit. I don't know where she is now, but let me tell you, I, I'm not going to give her any props at all. Miss Benoit, I'm going to spank you because... This is the thing, Miss <laughs> Miss Benoit. When I would show her TNT and you singing gorgeously in your high range, and Steve Perry and Bruce Dickinson and Rob Halford, Miss Benoit would say, "Oh, uh, we would. How are we going to sing that? How do we get that, Miss Benoit? We we want to learn. We want our singer to learn. I was just a guitar player. I wasn't a singer at that point. I was like, yeah. How do we get Greg to sing these high notes? She says, "Oh, that's just screaming." <laughs> And that's yeah. what, you know, my first, you know, introduction to voice lessons was that's just screaming and that like, like hit in the pit of my stomach and you can't see us right now, but I'm pointing like in my heart, my stomach, like that hit me. Like, really? Like that's screaming. Yeah. So you gotta, oh, so you just have that or you don't like, really? You can't learn this. <laughs> obviously years later, I learned that she was obviously super wrong. And as many of those teachers that came out of those years, uh, yeah, you know, in teachings were wrong. They were all like little choir teachers. <laughs> and and, and yeah. I had to see my first solo in the choir in falsetto. Right. That was my first solo. It was some falsetto thing. Okay. So how did you, someone that is, you're only, you're a few years older than me. You're not much older than me. You're only mm. a couple years older than me. How did someone like you, and I know your mom, Matt Corey, has given me a million things on you, so I'm going to scroll <laughs> i know your okay. mom was an opera singer and yeah was that something that you think really helped you in the beginning like what's the journey for you you know uh i was just lucky that i grew up in a house where there were there was a, there, there was a lot of music playing uh a lot of classical music of course but also a lot of popular music so there was a great mixture you know, I moved, I was moving around a lot. I was back and forth between my mom's house and my grandparents. And, but there was always music playing. Um, the first idol that I remember having was Glenn Campbell. And for anybody that follows my social media pages, uh, whenever, when, you know, like when he passed away, I posted a, a pretty long, uh, you know, little caption under a picture um, about, you know, how important he was to me. Um, and that was, that was probably my first real big influence, although I didn't know it at the time because I was so young, but I do remember being in the first grade and my grandmother used to invite my teachers over and some of her friends to hear me sing to Glenn Campbell records. So, <laughs> so according to her, as I got older, she did that because she was so freaked out about, <clears throat> I guess, how. Uh, she thought I was good at that young of an age. Excuse me, I was just... <clears throat> so, I think, um, you know, that's what, kind of where, where it began, but growing up in a family where everybody sang, I just kind of felt like, you know, it wasn't a big deal because everyone sang. Right. So, as I started to get older, I just always sang as I did everything, you know, and, but I was, you know, riding my skateboard and surfing. I grew up in, uh, in California. So I was, um, moving mostly, I lived in San Diego, but I also lived in, in, uh, Burbank. I lived in LA. I lived in, um, San Francisco for a couple of years and, uh, even Europe for a little while. Uh, my mom was, you know, we would kind of move wherever uh, the, her career, her opera career would take her. Um, I don't know. Did she have an influence? I mean, I guess what, what ended up happening was between all the popular music I was listening to, um, my mom would tend to go for folk music and um, all the stuff that was kind of, you know, happening in the 60s and early 70s. Um, you know, so a lot of folk, a lot of uh, um, Beatles, a lot of Beatles. Beatles were always, always playing all the time. And the newest albums were always in our house. And... Um, playing all you know constantly so that was filtering into my to my brain uh as well as of course the opera um but i think for me i probably was exposed to more popular music um my was, aunt was you know, a, my, my 
Yeah. Was there an opera singer that you remember as a child, as a man, no. uh, opposite that, no. you, that you could focus on? No. Okay. Just checking. Nah. I Just mean, checking. no. I mean, I mean, I was always at the operas that she was doing. I was an opera brat. She would put me on the floor during her lessons. Um, maybe I subconsciously picked up some things. I don't know. I yeah. was so young, uh, and I was a opera brat, so I was backstage. Sometimes they throw costumes on me and throw me out there, you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Two-two. but. Uh, yeah, probably. probably. <laughs> Don't tell Matt. Don't tell Matt, though. Oh, dude, um, he's probably got a picture of it. <laughs> Matt Corey's drooling right now. Hi, Matt. Matt, oh, pull God. your pants up. Pull them up. Uh, right, um, but anyway, uh, you know, I, my aunt was a kind of more of a rocker. She, she was younger than my mom. And when I stayed with her, she would pull out, like, the Zeppelin and the Creedence Clearwater and Three Dog Night and all that stuff. And... Uh, She's the one that actually, she gave me a stack of singles when I was um, probably about 10 years old. She just gave me like just probably 50 singles of just all kinds of stuff that I really hadn't heard a lot of before, you know, so there's a lot of rock in there. And and that was very influential for me. But again, I didn't, it it wasn't like a thing, you know, that I was going to do. But oddly, as I looked back later, I could see that along the way, I was constantly picking up musical idols. So there was probably something between Glenn Campbell and my next idol, which was, you know, I'm not embarrassed to say it was David Cassidy. And just saying, um, I saw that you said that on Facebook the other day, you talked about there's a, there's a documentary on him. Yeah, it just came out. It's really sad, though. I, yeah, you were I, saying it, you didn't, you didn't kinda, really like it. It's kind of hard. It's hard to watch. I mean, it's great to see the old footage, but it's hard to watch uh, him and, you know, the state he was in before he passed away. Right. But, you know, he was, uh, he just, I don't know why, I just was fascinated with the Partridge family, and I, I thought he was really cool, and I actually thought he had a really nice voice, you know. Mm-hmm. I thought he had a very, I was always kind of a tone guy. So I, I, when I listen back to all my influences, even brought up to current, you know, current times, I've always been very into the, the singer's tone has to really, you know, be something that I, that I really like a lot. It's got to sound very pleasant to me. And then I can sort of, you know, go further and get into the whole picture of their voice. You know, um, I tend to be more forgiving about, about, uh, not even more forgiving, I guess, more more willing to go into the singer's um, whole trip if 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 I'm drawn to their tone right. because then then I can get drawn to the emotion and to the whole picture much more you know much easier um, you know but anyway uh, you want to know that I mean I'll try to speed this up yeah so, so you, get up, went, you get up to you get, let's say you get up to like sixteen or in high school seventeen now now you're yeah. like going to be a singer you know it you know well no 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 I mean oh, okay. uh, so 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 fifteen years old I was a pro skater. Um, and then I wanted to be a pro surfer, and so I was surfing every day, hardcore. I was trying to get a sponsor, but that's around the time that I went from my from my motorcycle to my first car at 16. And when I got my first car, I put a stereo in there, and I had all my. This is really going to age me. All my eight tracks, and now I remember. I yeah, and I had uh, and a buddy of mine around around 15, 14, 15. A buddy of mine turned me on to. Um, a lot of my, for the first time, he gave me a couple of metal seat, like legit metal seat. Um, not, I almost said CDs. Um, uh, then would be black back to the future. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but I had a couple of, of eight track tapes and they were the first two. I remember were Judas priest stained class and, uh, and rainbow rising. And, and I, I know just, that Judas priest was a big influence for you. you. You've talked about that before. Yeah. I mean, those two, those two uh, particular, those two albums in particular, were just on. It seems like they were just rotating all the time. But especially, uh, I leaned especially towards uh, Stained Class, and that ended up really being, I would say, without a doubt, that particular album was the catalyst, probably for everything that would come afterwards with my interest in music. Because from there, I went backwards and went to an import store, bought all the Judas Priest albums. And I started singing a lot in my car, a lot. And I was determined to crack. I could sing, I could copy him in the low register, and I was really determined to crack whatever he was doing or however he got his voice to go up that high. And I I could, you know, I guess because I was, you know, blessed to have uh, 
to grow up in the family that I did with a mo- mother that was a singer, I-, I knew he wasn't using his falsetto. I knew it was um, something that he had figured out how to how to really sing powerfully uh, in his entire register. So I just sort of started to kind of chip away at it little by little, but I didn't really consciously think that I was learning this to do anything with it per se. Oh, I was okay. actually more interested in guitar and uh, so I was playing some electric guitar and I was still just surfing was it. But <clears throat> around um, uh, the summer, uh, my birthday's in September. So in the summertime when I was 16, towards the end of summer, my, my grandparents said, look, you know, we can't have you be a surfer. So you're either going, my mother had moved to New York City and I was still in California. So they kind of said, look, if you want to stay here, uh, you got to go to college, you, you know, or we're going to ship you out to your mom's. And I was like, well, I want to, you know, so uh, probably the dumbest decision I ever made was to, to, to say, no, I'll go to New York. And um, No, not at all. Not no, at but, all, not at all. I mean, you, you influence a <laughs> lot of people, man. Well, well, thank you. So I, I, I ended up, you know, in New York with my car and my surfboard in the back. And I was kind of like, a, I was like shell-shocked. I was <laughs> yeah, like, you're going to surf was, in the Hudson. You know, yeah, I, I had my uh, – well, no, I mean there's actually really good waves in Long Island Not bad. at times. Yeah, yeah. At times. Uh, it depends if there's a good swell. I happened to get lucky when I first moved here because it was around hurricane season. And I thought, oh, this isn't so bad. But then I found out later it's not really like that all the time. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, I, so I went surfing a lot for the first you know couple of months. And then it sort of was like this is not practical. <laughs> and uh, – um, so I was singing in my car and then, then we'll get to sort of how this all sort of took off. So I'm singing a lot in my car. I got a scholarship at a college out here, uh, for photography. So I was going to follow in my dad's photographer. So I was going to follow in his footsteps. Oh, okay. And I'm, I come to a stop sign one day, my windows are rolled down at summertime and these two rock and roll guys stop me. They're like, stop, stop. And I'm like, shit, they're going to kick my ass and kill me. You know, I don't know these guys. And they come running over long black hair, you know, uh, you know, tight jeans and, and leather jackets and stuff. And I'm like, wow, these guys look like they're in Van Halen or something. And I thought that was cool. So they came over and, and, and they said, uh, no, 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 man. Are you the guy that's been singing through the neighborhood? Like when you drive around, I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, oh, well, we, we keep hearing this guy singing like heavy metal through the neighborhood. What a trip. Uh, and I was in this neighborhood in Queens, New York, you know. And um, I said, I guess so. I mean... And they said, yeah, we're, we're, we know it's you. We, 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 we've been trying to track you down. We know you're, this is your car, blah, blah, blah. And they said, so do you want to come to uh, a rehearsal on Friday? And I was like, a rehearsal? I'd never been in a rehearsal room or whatever. So they're like, yeah, okay, so come down. So I went down and, you know, I grabbed the microphone and I just, I don't know, they told me to learn some Zeppelin and some other stuff. And I just went down and I started singing. And, um, you know, here I am in, in, in my first, probably I was about two or three months into college. Um, I wasn't really into it, but I was sort of dedicated that, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And I go into this rehearsal room and it was just the weirdest thing. It was, it was just overnight after that one night, it was like everything changed. And they, they of course asked me to, um, you know, they asked me to, to join the band and, uh, I think I had to ask them that they were playing hard to get, but I know that they wanted me to join the band. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. All I could do was grab the microphone and I could sing the songs, you know, but I had no idea really anything. I didn't wow. know anything at all. Um, so I did that. And as that first semester of college was going, I was in, you know, rehearsing with these guys. We never played any gigs. And I was getting better and better and better. We were probably rehearsing every week or so. And, uh, and probably at some point into the, the winter there, as, as the first semester ended, I was totally bored with school and was completely into being a musician, a singer. And, uh, and I thought to myself, well, you know, if I, if I go to college, I might do okay as a photographer, but, you know, there's no guarantee. And there's no guarantee with music either. But if I look at both of these things, it was kind of like um, I just felt like everybody was telling me that everybody liked my voice. And I, I hadn't gotten any, any negative feedback at all. In fact, I, everything was positive. So I thought, well, this seems easy. <laughs> Little did I know. Um, <laughs> But uh, so I, I went in and saw the counselor at school and I said, you know, 
I'm, I'm going to leave. And he said, oh, why don't you just change to music? And I, nah, 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 I'm going to go. So I threw, I threw a scholarship away. And uh, I quit the band, the first band, and immediately joined a better band. And that, that was the pattern from, from 16, uh, 16 or 17 uh, all the way through uh, till, till I joined TNT three years later. Um, you know, so how was, old were was, you? How old were you when you joined TNT? I was 21. Wow. Wow. And we signed, we signed, we signed with, uh, all that hair at 21. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. I started, well, I started growing it. Uh, I started growing it when I was probably 17, you know, so I did, um, Matt, uh, Matt, Matt, Corey, he had a, like, a a model wig of your hair when we were young and he used to like, he would wear it like to school and we would make fun of him and then we'd bring it home and he would sleep with it and pet it. It was like his pet. But it was your. It was a model of your hair. It was. A, it was a trip, dude. It was wow. a trip. Yeah. Well. So, you know. Uh, yeah. So I, I actually just. Uh, I had a pretty. Uh, I didn't really have a game plan, but I just sort of. Um, I just sort of uh, went forward with whatever plan was in my head, which was, I was completely going to get get into better and better bands to learn, you know, from better musicians, and also the goal was being that I was listening to all this great music, my standard was very high and I wanted to be in a band that sounded like as good as Judas Priest or Van Halen or any of the bands that I really loved. Right. And I was determined to just keep going and keep getting in better bands until I got one that was that good. So, you know, so, so I probably was in 15 bands in, 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 oh, wow. you know, the, the really, three like that years, many, like you were just jumping. Blah, 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 at blah, least, blah, blah, blah. at least, yeah. Oh my and, god! And I, I, I even joined one band that I that I knew from the onset was was not, you know, the the best band that I could you know get into. But they were playing all the clubs I wanted to play in New York City. Right. So, so my idea was I'll just join them for a while. They're good enough, and and somebody will see me, and it worked. And I went from that band into into a really good band uh, where we actually started to do something in New York. And that's the band that led to uh, one night, uh, a couple guys came backstage. One of them was Mike Varney. Oh, and yeah. he, was, he flew out. Of Tony, right? Um, he was what? He, 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 uh, Mark, Mike Varney would know of Tony. Uh, or Ronnie, excuse me, Latecro. Ronnie. Yeah. Um, no, no, he wasn't friends with Ronnie. But um, the TNT had a manager at the time in Long Island. Right. And uh, Mike Varney, I guess they were friends or they knew each other. And this guy put the feelers out and Mike Varney had heard about me. I didn't know any of this. And so Mike, Mike Varney flew out here and they both came backstage um, to the show. And oh, shoot. and they both came backstage and they brought a tape of, uh, of uh-huh. uh, Knights of the New Thunder. And uh, one side had just music and the other side had vocals. And they said, here you go. Uh, they already heard you. The guitar player wants you in the band. So it's up wow. to you. And if you decide to do it, you have to decide, you know, pretty quickly. And you'll be on a plane and you'll be over in, in Norway making a record. But they're only signed in Norway to uh, Mercury, Polygram. And I said, oh, OK, well, that's cool because I'll put a record out there. It'll be a really good demo and I'll you know, come back and, and get back with my New York guys. Well, here's a funny question. Do you yeah. remember, do you know, or do you remember, or did you ever know who sang the demo of Knights of New Thunder? Of course. Yeah. Because he was the first singer that sang on the first TNT album that was all in Norwegian before Knights. Oh, and I he know. actually, he actually started the band and he got, he got fired from the oh, band, amazing. but he was in a, he was in a really big boy band in Norway before TNT. Really? And he, yeah. Oh, and he trip. took his, yeah, he had like a three album deal and he took the last album de- that he had of the three and he turned that into a TNT album. Oh, and he, he he discovered he discovered Ronnie and Ronnie was when Ronnie was like maybe 17 or 18 years old. So when I joined TNT, uh, Ronnie was 20, I was 21 and then the other guys were a couple of years older than us. So uh-huh. it was kind of Ronnie and I were like the babies. And um, yeah, anyway, so you know, we, we did the record. I, I flew over there. I did the album. And, and, you know, the rest is, as they say, is history because uh, soon after it was mixed, um, it just started getting released everywhere until till they called us in New York and they, they did the big deal out of New York, uh, 
for the you know for three albums, blah now, blah blah worldwide. Now, being that I know a little bit of your background, had you studied yet? Because I know eventually you went and you were going to study with um, with Don, yeah, with Don Lawrence in New York. And yeah, have you I studied had, with I him had. yet? You had. I, I did. Yeah, I started actually in my first or second professional band that I joined um, when I was probably. Uh, mid 17 going on 18 i joined my first really really professional band they had to sneak me into the clubs and stuff um and that was in philadelphia and uh and i would come up on weekends and visit my mom and then i'd i'd stay over till monday i think i remember and i'd go for a lesson with don and then go back down um i think i started when i was 18 actually because i remember she bought me some lessons for my 18th birthday so i did about six months with him and built my foundation, and uh, it was a it was I was going to say a miracle because it really was it was just magical because he loved what I had somehow developed. He couldn't figure out how I had, you know, technically come so far without lessons, and so he just took what I had, had developed myself, and he just was excited and ran with it. You know, I was sort of like his uh, I was like his favorite student. He was just like, oh, okay, cool. I can take this. I can take this this voice to do something with it. So we were sort of, um, it was a great relationship for many years and I would always go back and, 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 uh, touch my voice up. And, uh, I still do from time to time. And I still, I still say I haven't had a lot of voice teachers, but I've, I've looked at enough and, and, you know, kind of, um, studied enough of it to, to feel like, uh, you know, I got very lucky in finding him. My mom found him actually. It was random. And, yeah, did I'm she, really uh, glad that did I did. You, did you ever get a chance to study with Mark with his dad or uh, just just him? No. Did you meet him? Yeah, or? just. Uh, oh yeah, he was there all the time because when when I started going, they had the two uh, two studios next uh-huh. to each other. So I used to see his dad all the time. And uh, what would you say the biggest things you got out of the lessons from Don? I've, I've met a lot of guys. Mm. That, I, I've gotten tapes from people that have taken studied with Don. So like, I, I what would they say the biggest? Wow. foundation things that you that you learned from from Don well you know the interesting thing about it is like now I mean I'll kind of come forward and then go backward so now when I when I you know when I see some some of the uh, people you know that are pushing for lessons online mm-hmm. um, and I kind of see what they're doing it and I, again, and I don't want this to sound in any way because, you know, I mean, I'm sure that. Don't that censor yourself getting, on this thing because I am not sen- I don't <laughs> censor shit. You know, well, this, sure that's what this are, is I'm about. Sure, this is I know. About. Well, I'm, I'm sure people are getting something out of, of, of it if, if they have the. Um, I, the way I look at it is if somebody has natural ability, it's probably going to be harder for a teacher to, to mess their voice up. You know, I think that on the other hand, uh, I think that uh, even just a slight technical, um, uh, uneducated technical teacher can really screw a voice up. Um, but anyway, back to Don, I think that uh, I didn't know any better. So for me, everything just felt right, right away. I mean, I was totally singing from a place of, uh, from, from a place of concepts that I had developed on my own based on the way that I listened to other singers, which I, which I actually, um, which I actually, when I work with other singers, I actually use that as part of my, uh, what I show them. Um, I don't know why I did what I did, but I just had a way of listening, uh, to other singers that was very instrumental in developing my voice before I got to Don and Don just sort of, um, so, so I had a good sense of, I guess, what I wanted to do, what my voice felt like, what felt right or wrong. And everything he did just made my voice feel better and open and free. And it did. I went to him with a very specific uh, thing I wanted to tackle. And we tackled it pretty fast. What was and, that? Uh, the thing everybody wants to tackle, which is, except for me, you see, I walked in with the ability to... Uh, I could sing really, really high, very powerfully in full voice, and I could sing through my break because this is a weird misconception. I don't know why people think this, but that was also great about Don. He really set me straight 
from from whenever I would hear weird things from other people, I would go in and say, what about this? And what about that? And he would always set me straight and say, you know, no, this is this is what this is. And, you know, this is your chest voice. And I was like, are you sure? Because people tell me it's fal- no, it's not falsetto singing falsetto. See, that's falsetto. You're not singing a falsetto. Um, and so he would you, show so me- you never Matt Corey wanted me to make sure I said. Yeah. Tony says he never ever touches falsetto. Is this true? That's not true. Never ever. I use it. Matt as Corey, a, you're on call. No, I use it. I use it as a um, emotional uh, right. express. I gotcha. use it. The, the kind, I guess I I use it the way the way singers like Chris Cornell or 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 Correct. I get you know it. or or other singers might a use it as a way choice. as a stylistic choice. But I never use it. Um, as a, as a, to hit a high note because I can't do it right in full voice. Right. Um, so when but you were no, singing no. 10,000 Lovers, some people would go, oh, that's just falsetto. 10,000 Lovers. And I'd be like, no, yeah. that's not. I'd be like, no, that's not falsetto. And that wasn't well, falsetto. No. And just to get, just to, just to touch on that for a minute. Um, if you, if you, if you heard me in a room live, mm-hmm. it would, it, people would, would, it would, you know, be, it's obvious because it's really, really, really fucking loud. I mean, um, I mean, I've, I've blown up a few, uh, a few, a few channels on boards in my life and, uh, recording and, um, you, you know, I have to record with compression. Just, I have to, because, right. uh, when I go from quiet to loud, it's really, the, the volume is really dramatic, you know? Um, but, uh, do you feel a switch in your voice at all from your lows to your highs? Do you feel any only, kind of switch? Only, only, only if I'm tired or sick. Otherwise, I don't really. If, if like I'm one. singing, if I'm singing a lot and I'm healthy, I don't really feel it much. Um, but what I was going to say was, when I went to him, when I went to Don, we, you asked me what did I want to fix. I right. walked in there at 18 years old, and I said, "Well, listen, I'm, 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 I'm. Once I get above a certain point, I'm fine. And once I'm, you know, under a certain point, I'm fine. And I can sing even through all of that, but I can't sing certain singers that I want to sing. Name one. Like, like at the time before Don, I couldn't sing. I mean, Halford, no, no problem. Robert Plant, no problem. Uh, you know, I mean, quite a few. Um, Brad Delp, no problem. Uh, there were a lot of singers that were that were. You know, no, that were easy, but I couldn't do, I could do some journey, but not all journey. And that bothered That's me. That's the consensus. I could, as I ask everybody I, on this wait, podcast, it's, 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 yeah. it's usually the consensus. But I could, and I couldn't really sing foreigner as well as I'd like. And I couldn't really do. So that Makes type of, of more, more of a mid rangey where their voice was more powerful in the middle, upper middle, as opposed to me that I sort of went over that you know so he 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 helped me strengthen that and then i went back and i joined another cover band where we it, i got so good then after dawn that we i did a whole show of, of foreigner awesome. and foreigner became for, foreigner became easy for me to do and journey i could do almost every song and actually i find that i'm almost better singing journey now than i was when i was younger and i think part of that is just um years and years of of singing, but so that was the tip. I mean, everybody wants to do that. The problem is, um, most people maybe don't aren't aren't looking to bridge the gap. Most people are looking to even just get through it, right. so they can go. You know, um, but anyway, uh, yeah, no, uh, he was really great with sort of making me understand uh, various elements of my voice, not making me focus on things that weren't important, which I hand down to people I work with as well. He, 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 his, his, uh, technique is based in very old, solid, legitimate vocal techniques, um, that go way back to like the 1700s and they work with almost every kind of singing, um, particularly hard rock, rock and pop music. So if you look at his roster, you see everybody from Christina Aguilera to Lady Gaga both of whom he discovered when they were very young and uh bono and myself and sebastian and uh john bon jovi well that was brief and and honestly as much as i hate saying it because i people might hear this i i i felt when he was studying with don that that was the best he ever sang that was um during uh, the new jersey 
uh, mm -hmm. album and, and tour, and also, I believe, also the, uh, the Blaze of Glory record. And on, those are the two albums where he really sounds, to Source, me, yeah, sounds great. the best he ever sounded. And that was all you know, when he was studying with Don. And then for whatever reason that I don't know, he just changed. And a lot of people do that. And to me, it's like, why would you filter, you know, and this is something too, why singers go to different teachers when it's working? I have no clue, you know, because that's that I was afraid to go to anybody else because yeah. I had such, such success. success with him. Every time I needed him, he was there. Listen, in 2009, I had career threatening surgery. Um, mm -hmm. I had thyroid, thyroid cancer and I had a very large uh, incision uh, made around my neck. <clears throat> because it had spread into my lymph nodes and uh, they got everything out and I went to an incredible surgeon who knew I was a singer who had done the surgery on other singers and he did a, an amazing job but still my muscles were tight uh, a lot of things needed to be you know slowly re rehabilitated and between the physical therapy I was getting you know basically somebody working on the 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 right. neck muscles to make sure that things didn't get the scar tissue didn't build up on my mm -hmm. neck, but also going to Don it, uh, you know, it really, the combination of that got me singing relatively, uh, quickly. And I had a record to work on as well, which helped a lot, but, but you know, he, he's just always been there. Do so you find, I, do, do you find with Don, cause I find this, do you find this pretty, pretty much a no nonsense approach? Yeah, I mean, for one, for one thing, I mean, I've sent people to Don who end up like running away in tears. He is not, he is not somebody. Yeah, he's look, I, I've I've known him since I've known him for for I mean, gosh, I mean, thirty thirty five plus years. Yeah. So for me, I know him. It doesn't bother me. He he. So many times he he's yelled at me and screamed at me, and you know, I know what he's going to do. But people can't handle him sometimes. But I mean, I look at him and I say, well. It's your loss because if you're going to run away because he made you feel bad, you're never going to find a teacher. And I really do say this. I, I will go as far as saying that, um, I mean, look, the guy doesn't advertise. He's not on social media. Yep. As far as I know, as far as I know, he still doesn't have any, any tapes out or anything like that. You have no, he doesn't. to go, you have to go to him. Yep. He's old school and you actually, he doesn't even have an assistant. You have to call his office. He picks up the phone. Yeah, he does. And he and he will book you if he's got an opening, but he normally has a waiting yeah, list. Yeah, I talked to him on the phone and, and he had a huge waiting list. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm working with Gaga right now. I won't be able to see anybody for like for like eight weeks. And he hates when teachers go to him to try to to try to grab things right. because and I understand why, because even myself, I mean, I work with other singers and I'm very careful about um, you know, how much of Don's technique and I do help them with that. But he, you see, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like these teachers out there that say, learn to sing like Chris Cornell. Well, that's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard because I'm sorry, Chris Cornell sings like Chris Cornell. And and I sing like me. And right, but I think Robert, they mean – well, I think they mean I'll stick up for myself is the underlying yeah. – the, there's an underlying technique. As Tony, I could never sing with rasp or anything like that for years and years and years. And then I listened to what Chris was doing, what 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 like um, uh, uh, Johnson from ACDC was doing, and I listened to what these guys were doing. And and then what I would do was on my gigs when I, I I had like a boring gig, I did like five years at the same club every Friday and Saturday. So I had I had this this outlet to go. Well, let me try a different kind of scream and singing on this one or two songs where no one's gonna really notice if I if I crack if I screw up. And then that's kind of how I figured those little things out. So not that I sound ex I could sound exactly like them, but I figured out, oh, oh, if I do ACDC, I can sound 80% like this guy. And if I do a Cornell tune, I can sound like this without killing myself. But, you know, and I, and I know what you're saying because being that I, you know, cut my teeth in cover bands, oh, I had to learn, I had to learn rasp early on. Exactly. And I, if, for anybody that if you're familiar with me, you know that I sometimes put rasp on things and sometimes I don't. Um, my voice is naturally, as you also know, crystal clear. Um, but, uh, but I do put it on sometimes on purpose and sometimes not. Um, and sometimes it comes 
when I'm when I'm when I've been singing a lot and I've been and my voice feels good and I've been like touring, for example, especially when I've been touring, I can put it on at will at times and uh, and it doesn't hurt or affect my voice in a negative way at all. Um, but when my, when I haven't been singing a lot, I find it's much harder to put good rasp on my voice than, um, than when I have been singing a lot. But anyway, do you, I think do that, you, you know, that's, that brings me to a question actually. Do you, um, yeah. do you warm you know, being like, uh, maybe you're not on the road every day, you know, you're not, you're not touring right now or anything like that, but do yeah. you warm your voice up every day or do you, I should, I'm, I'm a terrible example because okay. I used, I used to be meticulous about it and I really should be now because as you get older, um, you're just not as, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a great, it's a great example just to use. Um, if your body feels stiff when you get older, the same thing happens to your, yeah. you know, to your neck, your neck muscles and your, you know, all the muscles you use when you sing. And, uh, um, you know, honestly, uh, you know, I have to, I should, I should be keeping those more, more intact, but, uh, I have a show coming up in a couple of weeks and I, I started singing today. Okay. It's about three weeks, three weeks away. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, that is definitely a discipline thing and it only takes a half hour and it makes all the difference in do the you world. Have a you good, know, just, do you have like a regimen that you do? Like a, that, well, you know, I've got a really old Dawn warm up that, uh, that I just like using because, okay. Uh, it happens to just, it, it's only about 20, 25 minutes and it happens to take me through, you know, every part of my range that I need. It's a great warm up, And also when you, when you do a, a warm up with Don, you often take little breaks, uh, and let the vocal cords, um, mm-hmm. you know, rest and then come back again. And it's always a little stronger. But what I, what I meant though, about, about these singers, you know, about the teachers saying that they can make you sound like somebody one of, one of the things that I that I really um, um, try to try to work with other people on that I think is just so key and so important is individuality. And uh, there was a kid. Um, well, there, there's a few people that I'm working with now, and they'll bring songs to the table. Like maybe they'll they'll bring something by. Uh, let's say let's say just for example, I had one uh, one student bring a Creed song, and. Another one was, um, you know, was a similar, uh, a similar type of singer. And, and, you know, when you say rasp or not rasp, or you say that there's a tonality like the guy in Creed, you know, <clears throat> when you try to put that on that, that kind of tone, that's very, it's a very affected sound, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, but, but that's how they sing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's actually their voice, you know? Right. So when you, so what, when others, when you don't have that kind of voice and you try to take on certain, certain affectations of other singers that are natural for them, you can, I feel you can do a lot of damage to your voice because it will automatically throw singers into a completely bad technique. Can I play, because, devil's, can I play devil's advocate? Well, let me just finish the thought though. <laughs> the re, the reason I say that is because it, to create certain, it, especially, and I say especially when they don't really know what they're doing. Yeah. So when you get a okay. when you get an when you get an inexperienced singer who maybe hasn't had a lot of lessons and who comes to the table with something like that, I immediately try to take that song if that's what they want to sing, and I try to get them away from copying that singer while they're singing that song, and I try to just get them to get closer and closer and closer to their speaking voice mm-hmm. because the closer they can get to the tone now most people not everybody but most people when they speak at a normal volume they usually have a correct placement in the mouth of where the voice is going to resonate the best so i try mm-hmm. and get them to match that the best they can and go for the most natural delivery they possibly can and then sing the song to open them up and get them really used to, um, you know, the idea of copying a style, emulating a, a style and a, and a, and, um, a, fra- a phrasing of the singer. That's fine. All that stuff. But not falling too much into the dark sort of colorization of a lot of a lot of these singers, you know, so that they can mm-hmm. actually find their find their own voice but within the context of maybe something they really like. And then after 
they have a stronger technique, then it's easier to start to do copycat stuff, which is, you know, kind of how I cut my teeth when I was younger. Was That's I, what I was going to bring that back to. I was going to say, well, yeah. how you started yeah. when you were young, you were yeah. someone that kind of listened to uh, Rob Halford and that. And for, according yeah. to Matt Corey, yeah. Yeah. you're like me because I did the same thing. I would put the speaker close to my ear and pretend the voice of whoever I was trying, but I was different than you. You were, you were Rob Halford and those guys. I was Luther Vandross, Brian McKnight. I was trying to get that tone out of my mouth. So I would right. put that speaker to my ear and try to emulate what's going on and how can I get that pretend and feel like that sound was coming out of my mouth. So, yeah. so that's kind of like similarly, we learned similarly in a way. Ah, similarly. Yeah, what I, what, yeah what, I, what I would do, and I didn't know I was doing this until I analyzed it later. Cool. Was I would I would listen to my favorite singers and it was it was never just that's the I mean I always talk about Halford but it wasn't really ever just him right. I was always I think I was the reason I mentioned all those early idols I had was that I think I think I was always carrying those guys with me as I went forward so even if I was completely enamored with Halford there was some Paul McCartney running around in my head yeah, and there, I mean, was some, say, there was some there was some Glenn you know, Glenn Campbell running around in my head, you know. Dude, the but, Nights of New Thunder was such a you thing. Like, you had a, that record, it, it was like this voice that was coming out of you was, it was this beautiful, like, I, I would show it to, you know, girls that I was dating in high school and trying to get them in the back of the car. <laughs> and, and, they, and I'd be playing this, they'd be like, oh, she has a beautiful voice. Yeah. And I'd be like, no, no, that's a dude. And that, and they're yeah. like, wow. And they're like, they would listen to it and I was like, you had this thing. It was like obviously the height of Halford. Like Halford had those you know, the crazy the screams and all that kind of stuff. But you also could sing in this area and make it sound like Paul McCartney. Like, it, but up there, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I, right? I, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I didn't even know what I was doing. I, I literally <laughs> just no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't really understand when I went to do the TNT album. This was going to be. Sure, I had recorded r original music, and that's how TNT decided to that they wanted me was they got a demo with like ten songs, original songs on it that I had recorded all through the, all those bands I was in. But <clears throat> when I got to the TNT album and it was time to record it, I don't remember having any thoughts about, okay, this is my first album. What should I sound like? That that never entered my mind. Right. And 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 yet here I was about to do my first you know, original album that a lot of people were going to hear. Um, so what I did is I just, I just went in and I, I rewrote some of the stuff to suit my way of singing compared to the original guy. Um, but it was mostly, it was not, I didn't really write the songs, you know, I mean, they weren't really my lyrics. They were just all that Viking stuff. So I sort of, um, but the melodies, because I was so young, the lyrics weren't as vital to me at that point until I got into later albums and then into the nineties when they really, really got important to me. Um, but, uh, at that point when I went in to do the album, all I wanted to do was just do a great job. And, but what was the, uh, recording, what was the recording process like that when you did that record? It was fast. I mean, once, once I had a, everything written the way I want and changed, you know, I changed a few titles and a few, you know, some lyrics here and there, not much, but mostly with melodies. Once it was the way I wanted, I went in and I think I did the whole thing. I think I did. I was averaging two songs a day. Wow! And we we did and it did the yeah, this, the album didn't ha didn't have that many songs on it. So I think I think I did the whole record in about uh, about a week or so. And um, the first day, the band, the I, I hadn't gotten to the point of being nervous with people in the studio yet, you know. So so uh, the first day. Ronnie and I think maybe the other guys were in the control room. And uh, the first song I did was Seven Seas. Knocked that out in, I don't even know. I don't remember. In a couple hours maybe, if that. And then we went to lunch. And I came back and I did, uh, I did with the ballad, Without Your Love. And that was day one. Wow. So, and so, so at the end of that day, I guess they were pretty, they were pretty confident that it was going to go okay Very from trash, there. But yeah. 
but when I when I when I went when my approach with that was just to do a good job and to honor the songs, and that's always been my approach. That's continued from that point. I always wanted to. I didn't. I never wanted to um, do something vocally that would take away from a song. I always wanted to enhance what was written the best I could. I maybe I didn't always succeed, but that was my goal. Put a little salt and so pepper I, on there. Make it make it your own. Yeah. Somehow, um, but I never wanted to. Yeah, I just wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to just do my best, whatever that meant. And I mean, I wasn't afraid to do anything. I didn't have this thing about. It's heavy metal, so I can't do blues riffs or something. So you'll hear, like at the end of Deadly Metal, I do this, you know, kind of bluesy riff at the very end, which is kind of out of context. It, it it's sort of like I, I mean, little did I know at the time, I was just throwing every influence that I ever had without thinking about it. Right. And when I threw that in there, the producer w- went crazy. I didn't know. I just was like, yeah, okay, you know, cool. Um, but later I sort of, uh, people, Don Lawrence would always play that for people that came into his studio to basically say, you know, this is what I'm, what he was saying to people was, this is what he was capable of producing in a singer, you know? Um, but, but you see what I was going to get to, yeah, what I was going to get to was, uh, I think Morty, the bass player from TNT did an interview back then. And I think when I read it recently, I thought, wow. He kind of nailed it when he. So they asked him, "What you know? How would you describe your new singer, Tony?" Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, "I think he's a, like this interesting combination of Rob Halford and Steve Perry." And that's when I cool, go back man. and you know, when I go back and listen to it, I think that's interesting and probably maybe why, without thinking too much about it, I stood out a little bit because I wasn't just metal. Yeah, I was, no. I had sort of the melodic quality. Very melodic, built, yeah, yeah. You know, built there, there was a very singy, singy thing that was going on with the with the Halford thing. So it was this weird. You know, as you and, and, and as the records progressed, as you went out with the records, uh, and 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 out with your career through all the different bands, like I said, the Starbreaker and Westworld, all that stuff. You you ended up getting some rasp in your voice. Now, in, was that intentional? Or was that like, oh, this is kind of where my voice lies? Or no, no, I started to, I started to, uh, I mean, it kind of, it kind of started a little bit on intuition, and um, yeah, I started to throw a little rasp in there, and then I got a really raspy on uh, realized fantasies at times. Um, no, I started to be interested in. Um, and I didn't, again, I, uh, this is a lot of what I, what I did was kind of looking back on it was, uh, subconscious. I was just trying to, I was just trying to mature. I was just trying to get better and better and better and evolve and go somewhere. I didn't want to, I never wanted to stay stuck. Yeah. Uh, which is, which is why when TNT, um, you know, disbanded the first time, I immediately had a really good record deal for, um, with, with Polygram. And instead of doing a rock album, which I probably should have done, I went and did my favorite, I did the Morning Wood album, which was all my favorite cover track, cover songs from the seventies, you know, um, and a few originals because I wanted to, I was very eager to strip it all back down. Even being that young, uh, I wanted to strip it down and say, Okay, so you guys all know me as the high screamer, but this is actually what I sort of grew up with, you know. And I, I think I was just very eager to say, don't call me a metal singer. Don't call me this. Don't pigeonhole me. I'm just a singer. I just want to be known. I just want to be known as a singer. Yeah. I happen, I happen to have, you know, made a little, you know, small, small name for myself in the context of the hard rock metal world. But I was very eager to just say, but that's not what defines me, you know. Um, of course, as I go forward, I know that's what people know. So I know that's where I'm going to be able to pick up the quick, um, you know, the gigs and, and, and the, you know, the recording, um, mm-hmm. you know, get, guest appearances or recording project. So, so, of course, it's still something that until if, if I'm ever able to break out of that mold, which is. Hi, who knows, right? I'm not going to say it's unlikely. It, it might be, who knows. But until that time, that's what I always sort of have to do. So in the context of that type of singing, I said, okay, fine. 
if that's what I'm supposed to do and they always want the high notes, then I'm going to mix it up and I'm going to throw some curveballs in there and I'm just going to like play around with my voice and see what kind of tones and what kind of characters. That was the thing was characters. I wanted to develop characters based on the kind of songs I was writing because I started to write differently. The lyrics started to become more meaningful in the 90s and, and into the early 2000s. And mm-hmm. I, I needed to I needed to do something and I just sort of fell upon some raspy characters that I just I, – I liked how it sounded like on um, some of the Westworld stuff and, and like Firefly, the TNT album Firefly and Transistor. I got into a bit of a different vibe there. I would just pick up influences along the way. Right. Even stuff like Al- Alanis Morissette or – uh, Chris Cornell, different people. I would just pick up an influence and say, "I like this. I, yeah. This is cool." You know? Yeah, that's very so, cool. I, do you uh, do you after your performances or after the studio or after you know? I, I, obviously, when you're touring, do you do anything like? Um, this is another Matt Corey question. Most of these ladies and gentlemen have been Matt Corey <laughs> questions. Uh, do you warm down specifically, or do you just throw it away? You don't really warm down. Well, I, you know, I started asking Don about warming down in the 80s because I started hearing about it. And I would go to him because he told me what to do after a show. Mm-hmm. And he would just say, you know, look, you sing so high. But I guess he told everybody this no matter where they sang. Uh, but he would say to me, because your singing voice is so much higher or, you know, not singing voice, but because you have to sing such high notes, your voice is sitting in a much higher place than your speaking voice after a show. Right. So he would say, he would say after your shows, just come off stage and try to be quiet for like 15 minutes. Just try not to speak too much for about 15 minutes and let your voice just settle down. And then, and then if, if you're on tour, just try to speak as quietly as you can. Don't go to a loud bar or a club. Um, you know, and and I followed his uh, I followed his advice. I, I I nobody ever saw me back in the '80s after the show. I would go backstage. I you know I would uh, talk to a few few people. I'd sign a few things, and I'd be either on the bus in bed or I'd be back in my room, and I'd be quiet and drinking water, and yeah. you know, ooh, so it. glorious, right? Everyone thinks, oh, I'm being a rock singer, so glorious. No, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I ran I ran into uh, someone who worked for Striper when we toured with them. Uh, I ran into somebody at one of the NAMM shows where, where you and I were hanging out and I was having dinner with, um, uh, my buddy James Lomenzo and a few other people. Yeah. And there was a, there was a woman there and she was eating, you know, with us and halfway through the dinner, she looked at me and said, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't. And she said, well, you know, I worked for Striper on that tour. And I said, Oh, cool. You know? And <clears throat> so she said, yeah, you know, we had a nickname for you. And I said, Oh God, here it goes. You know? And she, she said, she said, yeah, we called you the Pope, you know, <laughs> because, because, you know, we, we just never saw you. you yeah, know? I get you it. Just be, yeah, you just, you never were at any of the parties at all. You were just gone. You know? I and mean, I said, you know, that, that's not the worst reputation. But. No, that is. And recently you said you, you quit drinking, you don't drink. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, it's, it's relatively recent, but uh, it's been about uh, – it's it's coming up on like five months now or something, yeah. Oh, good for you, man. That's cool. So no drinking. Um, as we wrap this thing, I up, mean, I I I mean, I've had my periods where right. You know, usually on tour in the old days, I I wouldn't really drink at all. Yes. Yeah, um, but I started to get a little bit uh, sloppy and lazy with all of that, and it started to get more and more and more and more. And uh, <clears throat> but it's you know. It is just, it's not just about the singing. It's really for health and every other reason, in, in the, you know, that Absolutely. you can think of. Yeah. <clears throat> That's cool. And is there any, uh, I always ask this, all the guys that I've had on this, I say, is there any singers, and you kind of said it with Steve Perry. That's why I said it was kind of like the general consensus. There's been a couple, uh, Ralph from, from Steel Panther and, and, uh, and, and uh, I think one of the other guys, who was it? Somebody else said it too. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, Greg, uh, Greg Scott, very good R&B singer that I know. Like I yeah. asked them, is there any singer like you've had to cover in the past that's kind of like a guy like, oh, I can't really get this guy very good. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and they were all, those guys were Steve Perry, a couple of them were <clears> Steve <throat> Perry. Is anyone for you besides him or is that, was someone in early years that was your guy like, that kind of gave you the hassle? Yeah, I, I, I got to the point 
I got to a point at, at somewhere along the way where, um, where Steve was really comfortable for me. And, uh, I, I haven't really sung covers yeah. in, in a, in a, I mean, you know, I do, I, I mean, there, there are some in my show, um, in my acoustic show, uh, I did do a private event, a couple private events last year and I did sing some journey. It, I didn't find it to be really difficult, but I don't know if you I were to have to do it now. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, um, again, you know, my voice and I, I, again, I tell, I tell singers this too. My voice changes, um, depending on how much I'm using it and depending on what I'm singing. Yeah. So for example, if I know I'm going to do a TNT tour, I have to kind of adjust. My voice takes a few weeks and it starts adjusting to the TNT range and register. Um, and from, from that register, it becomes more difficult to do things that are in, uh, that are very strong in the middle of my voice. Right. But then there was another tour that I did in 2010 where I did all queen songs in Spain. That's right. I remember and, I saw like a symphony or something, right? Yeah. And when I did that tour, my voice strengthened in, in the upper middle part because, you know, as high a voice as Freddie has, the bulk of the songs are not sitting up where TNT songs sit, you know? Course, right. So, so that's what happens when you sing. If you've got a big range, yeah. when you sing certain songs, your voice kind of strengthens in that area of what you're singing and it'll build, you right. know, kind of build up uh, in that, in that, at least that's my experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why, and this is a good, good thing to talk about on a, on a podcast that's uh, geared towards singing. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, not a lot, but some singers come to me when they start working with me and they know, you know, a lot of them are musicians and they'll come and say, well, you know, when I sing around a, a B <laughs> or a B flat, uh, you know, I have this issue yeah. and I, crin I cringe right away because I'll yeah. tell you why, because I never learned how to, I mean, obviously I know I being in it this long, you can't not know what notes you're singing to some degree and right. what, you know, general area you're singing in. But <clears throat> I don't pay a lot of attention to it because my voice changes from time to time. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. There are keys that are better for me, whether my voice is in good shape or not. Um, and, 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 but you know, to, to sit there and say, uh Oh, if, if you're sitting there as a musician and you're singing a song and you kind of like going, Oh no! Here comes that B flat range in my voice. You know, I mean, it's going to screw you up right? every time. Yeah, exactly. You're much better off, and I and that's what I love about Don's uh, Don's teaching technique. You're much better off going with a conceptual uh, a, approach to singing in your in your building of your technique, as opposed to these teachers that start talking about the anatomy and they make they make singers know what their vocal cords are doing it's complete to me it's completely useless it, it, to, me, they, uh, to me to me to me too, to me so. to me all you're doing is you're just giving people more bullshit to think about rather than just giving them simple effective concepts Bingo. and fee and feelings that they they can feel it when they know it's working they can feel it because usually what happens is it feels great therefore it sounds better right and that's that's all. You, well, and that's the, more, the intelligent. The more... You're you're doing the intelligent move. It's it's you, you, <laughs> you give them you give them the meat and potatoes. That's intelligence. Intellectualism it's... is when you when you hide behind all these big words because you can't do the intelligent move. So you go well... use all these big and <laughs> big words and all these like little things that you know it's not gonna. It, it's that's just ridiculous that's a whole well, you know you po you posted <laughs> i think it was you or maybe it was matt posted some clips um several months ago from a teacher who will name remain nameless that okay. we all we all know who we're talking about i'm not going to say his name and it's just look it's recalculous can every can every singer can every teacher sing amazingly well Probably not, but they should. I mean, Don is actually a really good singer, but he doesn't sing. He sings he actually. He sings. He sings a fair amount in his lessons, but but it's more just to show color, show position, uh, 
show people where to put, it's kind of an uh -huh. example thing that he does. And I right. do that too. I, I use it as an example thing, but right. he doesn't really sing, you right, know, right, right. um, you, you'll never hear him just sing a song for you, right, you know, right, right, right. but, uh, so I'm not sure that's necessarily a, a prerequisite to being a good teacher. But on the other hand, <laughs> there's that. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, between between all the technical, you know, just bullshit yeah. and I'll just say bullshit between, between all the technical crap that he spews out this particular person and there are a few like him as well, there's well. many um, there's many out there. It's, it's yeah. disgusting. And, it's, and what, what bothers me about these guys, these sort of. Um, you know, online self-proclaimed ex self-proclaimed self 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 geniuses self with no proclaimed maestros maestros with no maestros with no. I mean, with no. Look, I tell people I'm I'm an experienced recording artist, touring, you know, touring professional. Right. This is what I've been doing for you know many life. many many years. Your I've life. studied with a one of the best singers in the world, but. I tell them I am not the only way. What you're getting with me is you're getting a lot of different things rolled up into one. You're getting a lot of different experience in various areas. And I have a very, very kind of, you know, uh, unorthodox way of working with people that seems to work and that they seem to like and enjoy. But, uh, but I certainly would never go online and say, um, you know, I mean, I, I know of people who have actually reached out to people very close to me and which I find remarkable. Like, I mean, some of these guys knowing that I'm close with some of these people have reached out to them privately gone around me and said, you need me. I can make you a great singer because I know everything about, you know, and I'm just like, oh, my God. Man, like, no, that's ridiculous. I, I can understand that frustration. Um, yeah. Now, two things before we leave. Number one, uh, you recently touched out to one of my – you got you reached out. He reached out to you. One of my closest friends and biggest influences in my life, Jimmy Bell from Connecticut. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's, what's in the future with you as far as music? Is there anything maybe you might do with him maybe in the future? What's, uh, or anything else you know, that you might do? I'm in a place right now where Jimmy, first of all, Jimmy is a super great guy. So, 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 so is the rest of the band. Yeah. After all Chris, great guys. Yeah. Uh, Chris, Chris and BJ, um, yeah, good really, news. really nice people and very talented. All of them. Jimmy's, uh, you know, Jimmy's a monster. Um, you know, I'm at a place right now where I have uh, really no no ties. I'm trying to. This is, I, I see this period as sort of a rebuilding period. I've had a few of those. Anybody who has persevered, you know, in this business has had uh, several, you know, uh, sort of I guess reboots or restarts, and I'm having one of those now. And I have a few situations that are kind of uh, similar to that one with various people. Um, there's one in particular that I'm not going to talk about that is, uh, brewing. Uh, it's a couple guys in California. Um, and one guy out here, um, that's well. a very, that's a very, very interesting situation that I'm looking at, you know, as, as a really exciting, potentially very cool thing. You I've, I've also have, got, you have a, you always have a bed to lay down in because Matt Corey lives in California. You can always stay with Matt. He's got a nice. He keeps his sheets nice and cool, so if you ever need a place to stay, Matt Corey's your boy. Oh boy, you know, you know, people are gonna look this guy up and try to like, you know, I'm gonna be on, um, I'll, I'll be in blabbermouth tomorrow as uh, as well. As, they you should know. look up Matt Corey paints because Matt is an extremely good artist. He's so, a, he's a, you know, and who knew? Who knew? Suddenly, no, I know. Right? I, I noticed I, since I he was like twelve. Yeah, I mean, I knew this incredibly cool guy that was taking actually lessons, yeah, from, lessons me. from you. Yeah. And we developed a friendship. I came out to Nam. We were hanging out, you know, Not three you, of us. Yeah, and, we uh, all met each other, yeah. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, he's he's a, like a, putting these paintings up, and they're and they're really good. They're beautiful, you know? uh, which he owes me one. Amazing. He took mine out of my house. I he made me one. I paid for it. Gorgeous in my house. I had it in my studio. Yeah. It was gorgeous. He took it and has not replaced it. He took it. Wow. I had you it for know, like five, six months. He said, I want the painting back. I want to make a better one. Now i got an empty wall. It's a big empty wall. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so um, 
anyway, uh, well, I can't remember what you we said. We were talking what about music, question? but I would say Matt Corey oh, paints right. anybody, but he wants to yeah. do painting. Go check out Matt Corey yeah. paints, not Matt Corey's taint. It's Matt oh, boy. Corey wow. paints. Dot. Nice. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So, and you Poor were Matt. talking about. Poor Matt. Okay. No, so 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 I mean, I've got the Starbreaker record. Unfortunately, I just found out from the label that because of the long ramp up they need for vinyl, I thought it was coming out in the fall. And now they tell me today, I find out for the first time, it's not going to be out until January. But they will be putting out, we will be putting out singles leading up to the release. It's just um, kind of a drag. I'll be jumping most likely into another project for Frontiers. And it's a project where I won't be writing the song, so it's going to be just something that uh, they want me to sing on, which is which is okay. That's cool, yeah. And and also I'm I'm you know always been very eager to finally do my first solo record, as I'm sort of you know wanting to concentrate on uh, one of these uh, bands um, that are sort of um, one one in particular. Like I said, it's kind of I guess you could sort of call it a super group. That's, uh, that's, that, and, and we've already been working on some material. I should say they have, they're waiting for me to start to, you know, work on, on some of the stuff they've been working on, cool. but, um, I'm excited about that. And, uh, there's a few other, there are a few other things going on that, um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with them yet. There's a thing that I did last year, uh, called the, uh, uh, Renaissance orchestra. I think it's called with Greg Fox up in, uh, an incredible keyboard player up in um, Vegas. And he's, the, he's put together this really amazing, pro, it's kind of a progressive, uh, very, you know, kind of, uh, it's got a lot of cool influences and he wants to take that out on the road. So that may be happening. Um, you know, I'm looking to do my first, uh, you know, more touring in the U S mm-hmm. so yeah, you know, I'm just kind of, uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm wide open and awesome. I'm actually, um, I'm, I'm, sort of like hoping through some of these projects, the Starbreaker thing I'm really excited about. It, uh, it came out great. The songs are really, really good. And, uh, cool. so, you know, I'm just happy that I can at my age and you know what? I don't say it. So people, if they're that fucking interested, they can look well, it up on 20, Wikipedia. You're 28. You're 28. Yeah. I think you just turned 28. Yeah. 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 No, that's a good age. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm, but I'm looking forward to, um, I'm happy that I can sing the way I do, um, at my age, because I guess I, I, I mean, I always just thought it was normal, but what I realized is I got into my forties and people were all guys were already starting to lower keys and, yeah. you know, um, you know, things weren't, weren't coming out quite the same, but I'm, I'm really lucky. I think part of the reason I can still sing like this is, uh, Maybe that I haven't toured enough, <laughs> you know. Maybe I haven't done enough damage. But I think I think a lot of it is that I just I, I really do try. I'm not perfect, but I really do try to take care of it. Well, you were someone that I had think. it at a young age that that was was cultivating it, and then you met someone like Don that really helped you cultivate it even more. So it's a safe instrument, yeah. and it's a good instrument. And where can everyone uh, reach you? Like Instagram, give me some. Uh, and I'm I'm kind of gravitating towards Instagram more than anything these days. Okay. So it's just Tony Hart, Tony Harnell official there, um, and and it's easy there. You can click on an email. Tony Harnell official reach, at Instagram. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if you want to reach out to me there, I am on Facebook, of course, and okay. you can reach out to me there too. Um, cool. And uh, I'm also on Twitter. So everything is either Tony what? Harnell or Tony Harnell official. Okay, and that's gonna be on Twitter too. Well, I'm on Twitter in? as just yeah. But just, uh, yeah, man. Hey, this has been fun. I feel like we could talk about singing for like two episodes here. Absolutely, you know? man. And uh, I, th- I give a big, big shout out to Mr. Matty Corey. Corey. Little, Matt, little Matty Corey. <laughs> I grew up with him. He's, <laughs> I used to kick him in the chest when we were young. He's, uh, wow. Uh, yeah. He owes you one. Yeah. He owes you. Yeah. He's, he's Matty Corey, talented artist, great singer. Look he him is. up, Matt Corey Paints. Uh, and he's a handsome motherfucker, he too, is, isn't God, he? God, he's so good looking. <laughs> he always wears the right clothes. I always like. He really does. Wardrobe. He does. He always sharp. Way to he's, go, Matt he's, Corey. Re- he's a sharp dressed man. Oh, I give him a lot of plugs on this thing. He owes me. Um, <laughs> all right, hold on to the line. I'm gonna hang up. Uh, everybody, this is real singers on singing number ten with Tony Harnell. One of my influences as a child. Actually, I was riding with Tech Rose. My influence as a guitar player. One of them, because as you've seen Jimmy play, they're very similar in style. And um, yeah. Tony was the guy, that, the guy in the, in the voice that I would listen to him go, man, listen to that guy. And now, 
years later I became a singer and it was it's in there. It's 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 in there. So thank you, brother. <laughs> hold on a second. I'll hang up. All right, everybody. Okay, okay. Take care. Peace Thanks. out. Thanks, Dan. You got it, man.